Hi guys, it's Paul Check. Lovely to share some airspace with you again, live. Yoo-hoo, I'm actually here live. Woo! I'm with Matthew Walden, who's a longtime buddy of mine and who has been an instructor. He's a senior instructor. I don't know, is there anybody that's been around longer than you do? Not now, no. No, he, he, I think he's the senior instructor, him and Donald Carr probably. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, Matt, how long have you been with studying with me? And studying since 2001. 2001, so that's 16 years. Yeah, yeah, wow. still studying. <laughs> I met you when you were a young guy. You did, you did. Well, I first met you in 1997. Right. So that was in New Zealand. Wow. And uh, that was just a, a workshop or an, e an evening sort of workshop presentation. Right. And then uh, I went back to the UK yeah. and uh, was doing my master's degree and trying to... Uh, Write this thesis on hamstring strain in right. professional footballers, and that, that was when I looked you up um, uh, again, you uh -huh. know, and found out you were coming to the UK. Uh, yeah, so uh, so that was that was the, the proper first time that I, I got to meet you was in two thousand one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And many times since. Yes, yes. So uh, what I'd like to share for those of you that don't know Matthew, Matthew is an osteopath and he's a naturopath. <clears throat> so. Matthew's quite unique. We do have a fair number of medical professionals in the Czech system. Um, we have had uh, Dan Hellman, who is a physical therapist, work as an instructor for many years. Susie Neville is an instructor in New Zealand, and she is a physiotherapist trained in acupuncture and manipulative therapy. So within the Czech instructor base, we do have some very highly trained people Matthew is unique in that he has a degree in osteopathy and naturopathy. And uh, do you have other degrees or are those your two primary degrees? They're the two primary ones and then yeah. I, I did a master's after that just yeah. to, to top up a bit. So what was the master's in? That was osteopathic medicine as well. Okay, yeah. osteopathic. So yeah, yeah. Matthew's got a lot of uh, academic training and also a lot of clinical experience and has worked as a consultant for various elite athletes and professional sports teams. I know you've mm. worked for some big sports teams. Who have you done consulting Yes, yeah, so uh, I worked with Chelsea Football Club in the UK. Uh, it's a premiership football team there. Yeah. Um, and another one called Charlton Athletic Football Club where I just went in to train the medical staff and right. some of the things I've been presenting. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Surrey, Surrey County Cricket Club, which is the one of the elite cricket teams in the UK. Right. Yeah, so. And, he, and Matthew was the distributor for Five Fingers in the UK for many years, uh, up, right up till recently, and also started the, was it the Barefoot Conference, is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we did uh, Barefoot Connections Conferences, we did two of those. Yeah, I remember I spoke at one of them. We did, yeah, yeah, yeah in 2012, one. yeah, yeah. And so uh, Matthew developed his Primal Lifestyle uh, website and wrote all sorts of fantastic newsletters and posted lots of very interesting video clips to do with everything health. So it's exciting to be here with Matthew. He's here uh, to help me teach Czech level four. We've got a fantastic level four starting tomorrow with great students from all over the world. So uh, maybe Matthew, why don't you share just a little bit about your I think it'd be interesting for people to to hear, uh, you know, being trained as an osteopath and going through that system mm -hmm. and the naturopath, I, I think it might be interesting for people to hear why with all that training would you want to be in the Czech system Yeah, and, you know, my career has been riddled with people going, oh, how can I learn anything from this guy? He doesn't have a college degree. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, you know, to have guys like you with multiple degrees that find the system useful. So I think it might be fun for people to hear, well, what would a chiropractor or an osteopath or a traditional medical person or a naturopath, which is really supposed to be quite holistic, mm -hmm. why would a person like that need or have an interest in the Czech system. So if you can maybe share some of that, because there could be osteopaths, chiropractors, medical doctors, nurses, um, psychologists, and all sorts of people out there that look at something like this and not really realize that there is applicability. Yeah, yeah sure. So, well, I think, um, you know, the, from, 
the original training, you know, I, I love osteopathy, love naturopathy. I think it was, it is a fantastic uh, profession. And I, I worked in that profession exclusively <coughs> from uh, 97 was when I qualified, but of course I've been working clinically within the college setting for a couple of years before that. Then, uh, you know, had a few years exposure working in some very busy clinics and getting some, what appeared to be some, some good results. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I became quite aware that Osteopaths have a lot of techniques and tools for loosening up tight things, mm -hmm. you know, so I was very aware that, you know, if there's a tight joint or a tight muscle or tight fascia, it seemed like you could get a good effect with your hands, but that when there's loose things and things that aren't so stable, mm -hmm. uh, then it was really just a case of trying to apply the anatomy as best I understood it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be giving certain exercises mm -hmm. um, and, you know, do, doing my best essentially. And then when I saw you speak, I was very aware all of a sudden that there was, uh, you know, just a vast field out, out there that I didn't understand at all, like program design, for example. Mm -hmm. So the, the reps, sets, loads, tempos, rest periods, yeah. all, all those acute exercise variables, which I knew nothing about. Right. Um, and, you know, what particularly inspired me, there are a couple of things, actually. You know, so first of all, I, I, I write for the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapies, yeah. which is um, uh, Leon Chato's journal. And... Um, that came out in 1996, mm. and what they used to do in their original uh, sort of first few journals was they would take a topic and they would say, okay, this is a, uh, you know, adductor strain in a hockey player, mm -hmm. and they give this case history, and then they'd get an osteopath, a chiropractor, physio, and say an like, acupuncturist or a massage therapist to give their take on that case history. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at it and thinking, you know, that the osteopath was doing something I, I wouldn't do and I didn't rate what the osteopath was saying. And I was thinking, that's really weird because I'm just about to qualify as an osteopath. But this guy's doing something completely different and I think he's missing the point, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I'd look at what the chiropractor would do <clears throat> and I was thinking, well, that's more like what I would do. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the physio might be doing something different. And then I'd look at the massage therapist and think, wow, you know, this guy I could learn huge amounts from. Right. And so what, you know, the, I think the natural progression through a, a, a a degree like that and into a profession is that you start to create your identity as an osteopath right. and you start to distinguish yourself from we don't do what the chiropractors do we're special in this way we don't do what the massage therapists do we're more qualified or whatever it right. is you know there's yeah. all this kind of uh, way of thinking yeah. um, but the journal of bodywork made me realize that actually you know someone who is only a massage therapist could teach me huge amounts more than the other guys in that in that sort of panel right and so I think what it allowed me to do was to, to drop my uh, biases. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw you speak, I was thinking, my, my first reaction was, well, this guy hasn't got any qualifications, but it sounds like he's talking about something that's, you know, of interest. Mm -hmm. um, so I went along and saw you speak, and then I thought, well, you know, he really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> and, and talking about a lot of things, again, I don't understand or haven't been privy to. Um, and so that was, that was in New Zealand. So then when I saw you in you were coming to the UK in 2001, I thought, I've got to check this out further. Mm -hmm. um, but actually before that, I was doing the master's degree, looking at uh, hamstring strain in professional soccer players. Right. <clears throat> and, um, and I wrote to the institute then, um, hoping to try and track you down and, and you know, find out if you had any thoughts, because I knew you were mm -hmm. a specialist in sports injuries. And, uh, and also thought a bit differently to the materials I, I, I had been exposed to. Yeah. So I wrote to the institute and I got a reply to say, well, you, know, you should buy scientific back training. Yeah. Thought, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I bought it. And when it came through, I was looking at the material in it and watching the videos as they were then, <laughs> VHS videos. Um, and I was just blown away at the information. It was far ahead of anything I'd read. And mm -hmm. you've got to bear in mind, this, uh, this is in the space of three years, I'd done two degrees. So I'd done right. my BSc degree and thesis mm -hmm. on, on sports injuries. And then the same, the thesis for the masters was, was on sports injuries. So right. I was bang up to speed with all of the most recent research right. that I could find. Yeah. And then I saw scientific back training and, and I was blown away at how applied the information was and how useful it was. And I could obviously apply it straight away in practice. Yeah. Um, and then what blew me away further was I looked at the dates on the videos and I think they were shot in 1993 or 1994. 95, yeah. 95, was it? Okay. So 95, and, and then I was thinking, well, okay, so this guy must have been doing this for a few years prior to 1995 to get good enough Malone and confident Malone. enough to, to shoot some videos. Yeah. So that was really what inspired me to come to your, your mm -hmm. seminars in the UK. Yeah. Um, and so 
yeah, I, I mean, that started my Czech journey yeah. in 2001. You must have, uh, in regard to hamstring issues, mm. did you get into scientific core conditioning at some point? I did, I did beyond, uh, actually, yeah, that was, that was 2001, so that was after I'd done the, the master's uh -huh. thesis. I, I was already aware of the, the research from Australia, the Hodges and Hydes and Richardson yeah. and Jarl, and so I'd applied some of that, but um, again, not to the degree that you have in scientific core conditioning. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to see scientific core after I'd done the thesis led into me investigating hamstring strength further, mm -hmm. speaking at various events, writing papers and so on. So it's, it's been, and then as I've worked through the Czech system, you know, as, as I've evolved as a practitioner, I've evolved my concepts around hamstring strain as well. Right. So, uh, so that's uh, been quite a journey. Well, I remember on a few different occasions, you and I often on breaks at workshops or lunch periods, uh, maybe Brighton or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember a few times you and I discussing the issues of hamstring injury, which mm -hmm. I happen to have had a lot of experience with. I mean, mm. countless athletes with that. Mm. And I think you know, I even developed a patented exercise tool to uh, basically invert the prime movers mm. so that running athletes could do running in a swimming pool with a hydrotherapy device that creates resistance during hip extension, but it shuts the resistance off during yeah. hip flexion and knee extension so that an injured athlete could use the gait cycle mm to re-educate the motor pattern in a non-traumatic uh, or non-impact environment yeah. so that they could maintain an aerobic base but still actually do important work. Because for example, when I would have a lot of athletes, they'd have a lot of scar tissue mm. through their hamstrings. And as a therapist, when you break scar tissue up, as a byproduct of the therapy, you often get more bleeding. And yeah. if you don't keep the muscle moving, then it scars down even worse. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I found is that I could get people over their injuries much faster if I introduced pool therapy. And then if I had athletes that were under time pressure because they were on you know, professional circuits like, you know, professional... Uh, you know, I, like one of my guys was Tom Hunt, who had run 2740 in the 10K and was, you know, a world-class runner. And I'd worked with too many elite marathoners to even remember them all. Mm. So a lot of these guys made their living running. Mm. And, and I had biathletes and triathletes and people that, you know, were under a lot of pressure when their bodies weren't working. So I had to be quite elaborate in making every minute count. Yeah. You couldn't just do standard rehab and say, okay, I'll see you in two weeks, we'll do another friction therapy yeah, because yeah. in two weeks the whole thing could go backwards as worse than it was when they got there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had developed a fair bit of understanding and I think you and I got into a lot of conversations about that. Yeah, for sure. So it's interesting because, um, you know, you've been there, you've watched me uh, develop new models. Mm. So what I'd love to hear too is, is how did the Czech system enhance your naturopathic approach? And if we use the same concept, how did the Czech system and its nutrition and lifestyle components add another dimension to the issue of be it hamstring strain or musculoskeletal injury in general? Because that's still to this very day, very missing out there. It is, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, to link it into the hamstring research, what I found was that almost all of the research out there on hamstrings was focused on the hamstring, which, which might sound obvious, but there was practically no one talking about anything outside of the hamstring. So it was yeah. all about mm -hmm. hamstrings being too tight, being too, uh, you know, scarred, being mm -hmm. too weak, whatever it was, Late you know, tension link tension between quads and hams but it was all in the thigh. That was all they were talking about. And I found two papers across my entire searching that mentioned the low back. Mm -hmm. um, but even then it was really, you know, maybe just a sacroiliac joint problem could be contributing. There wasn't anything really about motor control or core control at that stage. Right. Um, and so, you know, as I heard you speaking about the core and then not only speaking about the core in terms of what I'd seen from Hodges and Hydes and those guys, but to, 
hear you talk about viscerosomatic reflexes, which I was aware of through my osteopathic training. It's something that is talked about a fair bit in, in osteopathic circles because a lot of the research was originally done by osteopaths or physiologists working with osteopaths, yeah. um, like Irving Kaur. Um, yeah. And then Frank Willard has, has kind of taken on his mantle to some degree. But, um, you know, to actually apply that to core function and to understand, it's really the way I was taught viscerosomatic reflexes was the notion that an organ can cause pain somewhere. Yeah. You know, so if someone's got low back pain, it might not be their back, it might be their uterus, yeah. or it might be their colon or something. Yeah. But I was never really taught the neurophysiology, which is what you were going into, of, of how the uh, afferent drives from, from the, or sensory drives from, from the colon, mm -hmm. could actually be creating sensitization of the cord, which can then shut down the, the tonic motor neurons feeding yeah. these, you know, deep inner muscles, yeah. the inner unit muscles. And um, as soon as you mentioned that and showed the slides, you had a, a beautiful slide of a, a woman whose stomach was not engaging below the umbilicus. Yes, and, yeah. and so I started looking for that in my patients mm -hmm. and seeing it and correlating it with their case histories. Yeah. And then of course, as I went through the check training, I had more and more tools to do that more accurately. So mm -hmm. the, the health appraisal questionnaire, for example, yeah. from a, HLC yeah. uh, too, that, um, that is a fantastic tool to mm -hmm. be able to help you identify where you're likely to be experiencing a viscerosomatic reflex uh, as a pain pattern. So looking at that, so if we take athletic injuries mm. in general, mm. just because that's what we're talking about, and I think for most people out there, they can associate with that fairly mm. easily. Um, what would the naturopathic approach be to such a case, and how would that approach be different than what uh, I taught you or that we teach in the Czech holistic lifestyle coaching system. Sure, okay. So well there's there's, there's sort of two two sides to naturopathy. There's there's the more sort of clinically applied side and then there's the more philosophical side. And and so philosophically you, you would want to use the model of considering the biochemistry, so nutrition really and mm. maybe pharmaceuticals. Um well that's not that naturopathic, but that's where it would fit it's, in. Yeah, but it know. is part of that model. Yeah. And then the emotional side and then the, the mechanical side. And so the mechanical side is where the osteopathy fits into naturopathy uh, very well. But um, in terms of something like hamstring strain, what you probably, what most naturopaths would do is, is they would look to nutrition straight away and they would say, okay, so, uh, you know, is he too inflamed? And, yeah. and so they may, uh, so um, uh, perhaps I should delineate a little bit between the, the, the more British style of naturopathy that I was trained in and the American or, or, or Canadian stars of, of naturopathy, which are, are far more uh, researched and referenced, mm -hmm. so and supplement based, <clears throat> so yeah. you're kind of using a pharmaceutical yeah, supplementation quite approach, allopathic, really. Yes. strangely. Yes, yes. Um, so, but at the same time, the, the, the British approach was um, a lot of old wives' tales that mm -hmm. you know have been around for a hundred years. If you put a uh, like a cabbage poultice on on the saw muscle or, yeah. or joint, mm -hmm. that, that should help as a naturopathic way, but there wasn't a lot of kind of uh, solid science behind it, right. it was a little bit of hearsay, um, and actually a lot of it turns out to be very effective. You know, and, and some of those things have been proven by research. They have now, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it, that's it. Which um, goes to make the point that wives' tales can oftentimes be deeper than we think they are. Yes, you yeah, Because yeah. that correlates to mythology. Right, right. You could say... <clears throat> there's a lot of mythology in the practice of being a medicine man, mm. you know, and a naturopath is a medicine man. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, I, we were still taught the model that um, really cholesterol was bad, saturated mm -hmm. fats were inflammatory, mm -hmm. and that you need to get people onto uh, either a vegetarian diet or, or perhaps vegetarian with some fish, yeah. uh, depending on their preferences. But really, that was the way we were taught at college by our nutrition lecturers and by our naturopathic mm -hmm. lecturers and so that would be the kind of approach I would have taken uh, prior to doing the check training would be to do that to acutely manage it you might use some hydrotherapy of some sort mm -hmm. in terms of a direct application like a cold pack or then mm -hmm. heat pack and stretching that kind of yeah. thing um, but that was where I would have been back in those early days of, of practicing and then obviously going through the check training and starting to recognize the effects of things like gluten in the diet and on the whole physiology, mm -hmm. not just on the gut physiology, but on the overall inflammatory state and the immune mm -hmm. state of the body. Um, 
Uh, and really also understanding that everyone's biochemistry is individual. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was, that was something which, when I heard you speaking about it, I just thought, well, this is the most naturopathic concept and, and the metabolic typing book I thought was one of the most naturopathic books I've ever read yeah but I'd never heard of it yeah and in fact you know when I first heard you speaking about nutrition which was in the UK when you came to the UK in 2001 um I thought you know Paul's an amazing presenter but he doesn't know too much about nutrition because he's recommending you know red meat for fast oxidizers and I didn't really know what a fast oxidizer was mm -hmm. and he's recommending you know that people should cut things like soya out of their diet but i knew soya to be a health food right. that's what i've been taught you know yeah. um because of that sort of more vegetarian angle it's yeah. like the the one vegetable that has this kind of complete array of, of amino acids so yeah. supposedly it's it's a wonder food you know and yeah. uh <laughs> well it does wonders all right <laughs> it does <laughs> it does <some> wonders <laughs> um so you know my initial thought was you know paul's amazing at all this sort of biomechanical stuff but i'm not sure he knows what he's talking about from a nutritional point of view, you yeah. know? So then I followed up on it because that's one of the things I've always been so impressed about with, with your presentations is that you leave that trail of references mm -hmm. and point to these different people. So if people are open-minded enough and willing to go and look into them, yeah. then they'll find the Walcott's book, for example, or, yeah. or the Biochemical Individuality book by yeah. James Williams. And, and um, many others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's interesting now you know, the, the other aspect that we haven't touched on is the, the energetics or the psyche. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the HLC model, and you've done uh, PPS training. Yeah. And you've also done a lot of uh, the four quadrant model now. Mm -hmm. So what would you now, if you were to go back, and give a lecture at an osteopathic or a naturopathic college, and you were to introduce some of these other concepts like the the, the psychic, the energetic, the mm. chakra systems, and things like the internal dynamics of a person's life, like having a dream, goal, or objective. Uh, you know, and there's other things too, because like if you look at, at the internal dynamics, we'll, we'll call it, the influence of the soul or the mm. psyche, then we get into all sorts of things like stress reactions leading to eating behaviors, lead to gut inflammation, mm. lead to chronic musculoskeletal problems. Yeah. So it must have been quite another shift for you to all of a sudden have this repertoire of evaluative skills mm. that in many of the circles that you come from would have considered complete foo-foo like yeah. uh, you know witch medicine yeah yeah absolutely yeah you know so starting with uh, spirituality uh, one of the things I, I have presented on this a number of times to professional conferences and, and so on and um, the way I always introduce it is I, I say you know uh, I, I use a physical, emotional, mental and spiritual approach. Mm -hmm. And I so say the reason that I do that is, um, you know, it doesn't matter what I believe and it doesn't matter what you guys in the audience believe, mm -hmm. but it really does matter what your patient believes. Exactly. You know, and, and so I think that's one way to get people straight away on site because they, they realize I'm not trying to preach uh, about spirituality to them in, right. in, in a way that they might not be ready for or, or mm -hmm. might find offensive. Yeah. But what I'm conveying is that it's so important what the patient believes, as, as yeah. we know from all the research around placebo and nocebo yeah. and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, so, so that's, that's one aspect of it. But I would say that, um, you know, the, the idea of pain being a teacher, you know, yeah. is, is a huge thing, I think, to um, introduce to patients in terms of them changing their perception and mm -hmm. uh, just shifting the way that they're looking at their problems and their challenges mm -hmm. in life, whether that be physical ones or emotional, mental, or spiritual. Um, but the other thing that has been huge uh, for me in, in understanding really uh, or, or finding something that really gels with my own sense of why I'm here is, is the, the, the one, two, three, four model. Yeah. And so uh, in that model, the, the, the one obviously is finding your one love, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and your legacy um, and your dream. And, um, and so my my sense has always been that if if we're here to do anything it, it's got to be to realize our potential yeah you know that has to be if there's a purpose to life it's got to be to realize our potential which of course everyone is is doing to some degree but 
the therapy industry, if you like, or, or the treatment industry that you find in, in manual therapy gets people out of pain mm -hmm. or attempts to get people out of pain, but that doesn't necessarily move them towards their purpose mm -hmm. or towards their legacy. Because, you know, a very simple example of this, which I was just talking to the students about last week, is that, you know, there's lots of research on the multifidus, for example, yeah. low back pain. And very, very clear research that the multifidus not only gets inhibited by the pain, but also will atrophy across a period of time. Yeah. So if the multifidus is atrophied right down, mm -hmm. and then you get some very sort of skilled physiotherapist coming in and, and asking that client, identifying the issue, asking the client to palpate their multifidus and to swell the multifidus and to activate, mm -hmm. that's great. But it's only the starting stage because, yeah. and that may get them out of pain, but mm -hmm you're not really creating a hypertrophy stimulus mm -hmm. by just getting someone to swell their multifidus. No. That's why they need to move not just from that flexibility and stability stage, but yeah. into the strength stage that you yeah. talk about, yeah. and even to power, yeah. to help to prevent injury and to get to the point where they realize in their dream, yeah. physically. Well, you know, the, the, if you just look at that chain of events you just talked about, so let's say you have a case like that where mm. someone's got a back injury the multifidus is shut down, or maybe they have uh, multifidus firing on the left but not the right, mm. which induces a rotational torque every time they pick something up. And you try to get that muscle to swell, mm. and maybe you can get it to swell a little bit with an isolated therapy, but the muscle still may not engage in a hypertrophy response because it can be modulated. Mm from a viscero-sensory level or visceromotor level. Yeah. So let's just say a person's got inflammation in their intestinal tract. If it's the hamstring or the low back, it could be any of the uh, organs from the belly button down quite yeah. classically, or the kidneys, um, or like adrenal fatigue could be doing that. Mm -hmm. So then this is really the part that I found over and over again in my own research, empirical research, monitoring clients, because as you know, I get the tough clients sent mm -hmm. to me. You know, I'm the weirdo that everyone says, well, when nothing works, send them to that guy. Yeah. And so once again, you see, we get back to this chain of events that most of the medical system and a lot of even the allied medical practitioners still don't connect the bridges, even though there's plenty of research showing it out there, and that is this. Let's say that the person has adrenal exhaustion, and that's mm. reflexively affecting their multifidus. Mm. Or they have, uh, if it's the right side multifidus, they might have uh, a parasite infection affecting the uh, ascending colon yeah. or the cecum, which is a common site for worm infections, for example. Mm -hmm. And so then we say, well, let's test them for parasites. Yes, they have parasites. And then we look at their diet and we find that they're eating a lot of garbage food and they're eating too much processed foods. And then we end up finding that it's very hard to get people to change their diets because they're, they actually are using these things as comfort foods. And then we say, well, what do you need the comfort from? Mm -hmm. Well, then we find out things that they're in a marriage that they're not happy in, or they're working at a job that they're not happy in. And we ask, well, how long have you been married? 10 years. How long have you been unhappy? Nine. Mm -hmm. Have you got counseling? Well, not really. Why? Because I really don't want to be in the marriage. But why don't you get out? Well, then you get some religious concept. Well, mm -hmm. you know, till death do you part or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you find out that to get people to change their behavior is almost impossible unless you can anchor it in some concept of a specific dream goal or objective that empowers them and inspires them to be willing to participate. Yeah. Otherwise, what you have is you have therapists poking at back muscles and wiggling hamstrings and working on scar tissue and giving people pills, but these things never work. Mm. They never work for the long run. You might... And the other thing is the medical system, as you know, has gotten very good at getting rid of people's pain. Yeah. You, you yeah. can knock pain out with lots of drugs mm. and lots of techniques. You know, there's all sorts of ways to trick the nervous system, use stimulation and many things that I, I won't go into technically. But at the end of the day, it's like the difference between cutting a weed off at the top or pulling it out by the roots in the garden. And 
I've always prided myself in helping people make legitimate transitions. In other words, if I'm working with an athlete that has chronic hamstring injuries or chronic back problems, my feeling is, is I need to help that person understand the process by which they create the problem. Mm -hmm. And that has to go all the way to their choices, and the choices are exemplifications of belief systems, right? Almost yeah. all our choices yeah. are tracked back to our belief systems. And, I mean, just like you just said, and even today you can find piles of medical literature that doesn't even get into any of the thing that we teach in the Czech program, and, and they think they're at the top of the bell curve of, mm -hmm. of technology and, and smartness and whatever else, mm -hmm. yet they're overlooking massive amounts of critical information. So what you get is a lot of people getting rubbed, getting ultrasounded, getting this vibrocussor or that fascial technique or fish oil or friction massage or stretching. But what you see is they have relief for a period of time, but oftentimes as soon as they get into a high enough level of training or work strep or relationship stress, mm -hmm. all of a sudden their injury's back. Yeah. And yeah. they just tend to go for stronger drugs yeah. Yeah. and or stronger therapists, mm -hmm. but ultimately don't really get to the core issues. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and the totem pole was something that I developed because I needed a system that could help me distinguish what was the most important thing to evaluate first because the body is very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. So once I begin to identify a hamstring injury, okay, a hamstring injury is down in the lower element of the body, it's connected to the root chakra, but the hamstring itself isn't, um, isn't very intelligent. Mm -hmm. It's a slave to the motor system, mm -hmm. which is a slave to the visceral system, which is a slave to the auditory vestibular system, and a slave to the eyes, and a slave to the jaw. Mm -hmm and a slave to the psyche, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of things that the hamstring is, you know, the hamstring is like a private in an army and it's yeah. taking orders mm -hmm. from a whole cadre of hierarchical yeah. uh, officers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so the introduction of the totem pole, which took me probably about 10 years to f work out and do all the research on, I had to read countless research papers and mm -hmm. talk to some very skilled people to get questions answered. But most of it came from clinical observation and, and studying the anatomy, the physiology, and the related things. Yeah. But then it developed a hierarchical system. And that hierarchical system includes diet, it includes lifestyle, it includes yeah. the dream. And it, it actually amazed me that, you know, I developed the totem pole, oh, I can't remember, it's been so long, probably by 2000, I would guess. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but... Um, you know, I'd been working in, I started working uh, professionally in 1984 as the trainer of the Army boxing team. Mm. I started working in a physical therapy clinic. I, well, actually, I worked in a chiropractic office in 86. I started working in a, uh, the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego with a surgical center in um, uh, 88. Right. And I spent four years in there. So I was working with, you know, many therapists with master's degrees and mm. cutting edge doctors and therapists. And mm. these concepts were, you know, not only were they not heard of, but I got quite ridiculed when I tried to implement them. Right. And I had to spend hours and hours explaining anatomy and physiology mm. and all things related. And mm. even then they had a hard time digesting it. I must give credit. Some of them took it on board and thought it was just absolutely amazing yeah. because they could see the logic in it. So it's, it's, a, it's quite an interesting journey. So, if you were to give any words of inspiration to professional medical people, be it physicians, osteopaths, chiropractors, physiotherapists, with regard to what the Czech system offers them with all your experience and degrees, what would your words of inspiration be? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I, I was going to mention the this for that approach, which I think is still quite rife yeah. throughout manual therapies and yeah. uh, and nutritional therapies and so on. And I think uh, to hear that being explained, uh, so you know, which is obviously taking this remedy for that condition or yeah. this pill, or 
that was the way I was thinking because that's the way really the whole system is set up mm -hmm. rather than thinking about the health of the individual and the overall function and, and the needs of the individual. And so then that does link back into their physical needs, their emotional needs, mental, spiritual needs. And so if you wanted a system that incorporated all of that but that also gives you effective tools and strategies to be able to work with those factors, yeah. then the check system would be the one that I'd recommend. I mean, it's the only one I've found that, that does that, yeah. that holistically. Um, and, and the beauty of it is, is that it empowers the individual to help themselves and develop, to develop their own living philosophy as opposed to telling them what they should do. You yeah. know, so it's a coach, that coaching model of, of letting them find themselves rather yeah. than telling them this is how you need to live. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that's, that's uh, for me, that's really exciting and it feels like it's something I can attach my own purpose to. And so I think most people could resonate with that. The challenge for, for most healthcare professionals is that it's a big shift from what they're doing yes. currently, you know. And so on that front, obviously they would have to um, work their way through the system uh, as I did if they want to, to train up in the system themselves and then to gradually uh, integrate the new approaches into their, their current practice so, and gradually expand that out. So yeah. that's, that's the way I did it. Um, but I think the, the, the danger is that people sometimes see the Czech system as another CPD course that they can go on and then just grab the bits that they want from it. And it doesn't really work like that because it's really a whole whole system. Yeah. Because the body's a whole system. Yeah. And you can't just pick the bit that you want to work on and think that that's working holistically. Yeah. You know? No. You know, it it is a problem. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are lazy, so they don't want to do the work to study the interrelationships. Mm. And as you know from going to chiropractic and osteopathic and every other kind of conference out there, most of the doctors and therapists are worse off than their patients as far as their own health yeah. and vitality yeah. and diet and lifestyle. So yeah. the, uh, the other challenge that I've always faced with my students is that a lot of them don't want to do the work to apply the technology to themselves. So it actually always becomes a theory that they're applying. Yeah. And whenever you're applying a theory, you can never really be rooted in your own confidence or your own authenticity. Mm -hmm. Everything that I teach, I tested on myself first. I've always been my first guinea pig, mm -hmm. no matter what it was. When I tested diet uh, techniques, supplement techniques, you know, I tested piles of stuff. I studied medical nutrition for years. I studied Jeffrey Bland's work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I studied a pile of stuff and I use these different systems but for example when I studied metabolic typing and used metabolic typing compared to nutraceutical approaches it was just night and day it was mm. like I can throw all these pills out the window mm. because mm. there's nothing more powerful than high quality food that's non-toxic and learning how to choose the foods that your body wants and there's a good example where learning to take care of yourself Instead of reading a diet book and eating what somebody else tells you mm. or, or thinking that just because it made your mother thin, it's going to make you thin or because your girlfriend's butt got smaller, yours is going to get smaller or because your buddy got six pack abs on the South Beach diet or some other diet is going to work for you. You actually go into a legitimate process of spiritual growth because you have to engage your body. Yeah. You have to pay attention. Well, what happens when I eat chocolate? One guy says it makes me feel great. The other one says it gives me pimples and gives me phlegm and makes my brain foggy. Mm. So, you know, I think we have a cultural problem in that um, most human beings are still so wrapped up in the authority model, mm. the, the, the priest, the, yeah. the white jacket, the expert is mm. going to tell me what to do and I read somebody's book and they've got to be an expert so I'll just follow the book. Yeah. But the reality of, is it, of that is that leaves you in the position in, with regard to psychological development of a child being told what to do and trusting external authority more than you trust your own body, your own symptoms, yeah. your own emotions, your own feelings, your own intuitions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, that's the difference between a treatment model mm -hmm. and a coaching model. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and ultimately, I train all Czech professionals, as you do, 
to coach people to learn to take care of themselves and engage themselves, engage their body, mm -hmm. engage their emotions, engage their mind, engage their relationships, understand what a soul is yeah. and how it works, and learn to trust your heart as much as you trust your head and be honest in relationships and mm -hmm. be honest with yourself. But that really turns out to be spiritual growth and development. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. in a culture that's steeped in the religion of medicine, the religion of reduction of science, mm -hmm. and the religion of religion, yeah. all of which is someone else telling you what to do, it's quite a radical transition. Yeah. And if you look at the planet as a being, we are actually doing the same things to the planet with that very model that we have done to ourselves. And so we're kind of at a place in the development of man now that if we don't um, grow up, as Ken Wilber and Dustin DiPerna say, mm. you got to uh, wake up, grow up, and show up. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, for me, the Czech system was my best attempt to offer a pathway so that somebody from any walk of life, I mean, we have Czech professionals, as you know, they're mothers, mm -hmm. truck drivers, bartenders, mm -hmm. that usually come in because of their own health crisis, find a Czech professional, have radical results, and go, I've got to know more about this, yeah. and ultimately end up making a, a, a shift in their dream yeah. to go out and help people. And so I hope all Czech professionals are inspired to engage the wake up, uh, show, wake up, grow up, and show up. Mm -hmm. And that yes, means absolutely. you got to eat, sleep, breathe it, shit it, and be it mm -hmm. instead of faking it. And, and hope, you know, and <laughs> as Tony Robbins says, fake it till you make it. But unfortunately, that doesn't really work in practice. Yeah. It's a cliche, but it doesn't work in practice. Mm.